Hello everyone and welcome to Elle's Hat. So I recently went through a phase of going through my old books that I just owned for the last 5, 10, even more years and that I mostly did not really touch during that time. That means since I first read them when I was obviously a lot younger than I am now. I don't know exactly why I did that. Maybe I was just feeling nostalgic. I don't know. There's definitely something comforting about reading a story that you've already read before, even if it's been years and you don't really remember much of the actual plot. Or maybe it was because in the last years I've noticed kind of a resurgence in fantasy books, especially in YA fantasy series, that in their core remind me a lot of the fantasy books that were just everywhere roughly 10 years ago. I kind of feel like making a video comparing the genre, how it was then versus how it is now, like what new aspects came into the stories over the years, what old tropes are still thriving for better or for worse. But yeah, that's a video for another day, maybe, we'll see. Because today I want to talk about one of the book series that I found between my old books. And that honestly I hadn't thought about in years. I'm of course talking about the Black Magician trilogy by Trudy Canavan. I haven't really seen many people talk about it on YouTube or just in general over the past years, which to me is interesting because I can see so many parallels between this series and things that are popular now in YA fantasy. But this video is not really going to be an analytical video essay on that. I mostly just wanted to share my thoughts on what it was like to read the series now as an adult. It's just my personal thoughts and opinions. Might be a bit rambly, but here we go. For a bit of context, for those that don't know the series, or like me when I rediscovered it, can't remember the details, the Black Magician trilogy contains three books. Number one, The Magician's Guild number two, The Novice, and number three, The High Lord. The story centers around Sonia. Sonia? I don't know, let's call her Sonia. Sonia is a girl living in the fictional city of Marden. Specifically, she's living kind of in the slums, like in the very poor district at the outskirts of the city. And because it's a YA fantasy book, the story starts with her discovering that she has magical powers. And that kind of makes her the center of attention of the Magician's Guild. And I want to save the spoilers for the later part of the video, but it is established really early on that Sonia does not like the Magician's Guild. Like, she thinks the worst of them. For her, they just symbolize, like, the oppression and social injustice of the world that she lives in. But that guild is basically all the people that have magical power. That's just how it works. You can't just do magic and do your own thing. There's obviously reasons for that in the story. But I just wanted to outline the starting conflict of the first book and from there on the story develops. And it did so very successfully. The Magician's Guild was actually the first published book by the author Trudy Canavan all the way back in 2001. And the book the whole series was a huge success back then. I can't really remember when I first read the first book, definitely some years later than 2001, 
But I do remember that eventually the books were everywhere. In bookstores, libraries, everyone who was into fantasy at that time had read them. And so did I, because I was hugely into fantasy at that time. And I remember liking the series back then as a teenager, but there was a reason why I never read the series a second time. I will get into that in a few moments when we will be going into spoiler territory. So, liked it as a teenager, what did I think about it as an adult? For those that want to click off before any spoilers, because they still want to read the books and don't want to be exposed to spoilers, just very quickly, yes, I liked the books. Do I think that everyone should read them because they are just that good? No. Do I feel absolutely comfortable recommending them because there's just nothing questionable or problematic about them? Also no. But did I enjoy reading them for a second time? Yeah, I did. And I still think they are just a good read. They entertained me, the story is compelling, there is a magical kind of world. Like you can tell that effort went into world building. There are interesting enough characters, even outside the main protagonists. There are moral conflicts, and especially in the first book you'll find quite a bit of social commentary woven into the story, which I quite liked. So I would say, if stories like that are your thing, and if you feel at all intrigued by the series, then go ahead and read for yourself. And maybe consider finishing the video here, because from here on there will be heavy spoilers for the Black Magician trilogy, so be warned. So, spoiler warning done, you're still here, let's get into it. I want to go book by book, because for me the three books have very different vibes to them, kind of. I don't want to go too in-depth, I think, but the more I talk, the more I just think about things to talk about. So, honestly, let's just see how it goes. Let's start with book one, The Magician's Guild. I liked the first book especially the beginning. I don't really know if this is unusual or just the most normal thing ever, but I quite like beginnings in books, if they're done well. There's just something about it, like you get introduced into this world that you're going to be living in for the next amount of time while you're reading the book. And... You get to know all those little aspects of it, meet all those characters. Yeah, I like that, and I think that's done well in this book. You follow Sonia, who is living in this city that has a pretty clear divide between poor people and rich people. And Sonia is among the very poor. She's friends with those street gang kids and... She does have an aunt and an uncle that she lives with, but overall she has learned to fend for herself. And I like that for her as a character. Like, in a way, she is your typical 15, 16 year old girl with a tragic backstory and complete with a best friend who's secretly in love with her. And then all of a sudden she has those special powers and everything's just getting adventurous. <laughs> like, she is that. But to me she still felt like a person. She has her reasons for what she does. She has her view of the world, which gets challenged as the story progresses. And also she's kind of a badass. Like, not in an over-the-top way. It's not that she's unfazed by the things that happen. Maybe I just enjoy that she's not as whiny as 
many other YA protagonists. I don't know. But then again, she does spend most of the time of the first book in hiding, being hit by the best friend that has a crush on her, and also a whole underground network of thieves, which is a pretty interesting part of the story. The thieves, I like them. Oh yeah, now that I think about it, she doesn't really do that much during the first book, except hiding and failing at controlling her magic. Hmm. But then again, she is like 15 or something. Like, what is she supposed to do when the whole city is just full of people with magical powers that are looking for her? Anyway, what was I talking about? Sunea, interesting enough protagonist, let's just say that. And yeah, that's basically what's happening. Sunea discovers her magic powers Injures a member of the guild, and now the guild is after her. They are searching the city, and Sunea is in hiding. She's terrified, she resents them, and also she thinks they are going to kill her. It's like this cat and mouse hunting thing around the city, and all the while Sunea is trying to control her magical powers. But she kind of fails. Sometimes... The perspective in the book shifts to other people, like people in the guild, so it's not all just from Sunea's point of view, which I quite liked. I think that was a great choice. And I also kind of think that maybe it contributed to, at some point, making the conflict feel a little bit forced. But no, actually, I don't think the perspective shift was the problem here. Because I thought that was actually great. I think the problem was just that that part of the book stretched a little too long. Because from those parts, from other people's viewpoints, we learn that the people in the guild do not actually want to kill Sunea. I mean, there's mixed feelings about that. But overall, they don't mean her harm. Instead, it is her developing magical powers that actually pose a threat to her. Because if they are not controlled, they can be very dangerous. Also, we learn that it is super rare for magical powers to just spontaneously like they did with Sonea. So probably her powers are very strong. And also we learn that there is this whole debate within the guild whether they should allow her to be able to study magic. Because at least for the last few centuries, the study of magic was really only an option for rich people from the rich families. Gotta love the classism. And so now, obviously, no one's sure whether they should dare to take in the street girl. Who knows what she might be up to. Okay, so far so good. Nothing groundbreakingly new here, but I liked it. I think the hiding part dragged on for a little too long, but I guess that in this situation, just talking it out would not have helped, because Sonia would simply not have believed anyone who said anything good about the guild. There's this one scene where she and the best friend kind of visit the guild or go to an excursion to check out the grounds of the guild in hopes that Sunea might catch some glimpses of people performing magic and that might help her to control her magic. Something like that. Um, it's an interesting scene because for one... They do actually spy through windows and look at people studying magic, um, which I think they are studying healing, which for Sunea is something new because she only knows magic as a weapon, as a tool to enforce oppression on the people. So her seeing magic be used for a good cause, to heal people, that does something to her. Then this kind of good impression is already 
shattered immediately because while they are on the ground of the guild, Sonia stumbles upon a scene that might seem a little bit random, but it is important for the plot of books two and three. So that's why I'm telling you. Basically, Sonia sees a man murder another man using magic. And this is described as pretty creepy and it happens in the basement of this building that's in a little forest. For Sonia, it is not too shocking to see that. Like in her world where she comes from, assassins do exist. So why wouldn't the guild also have assassins that kill using magic? That's her thought on it but still it's creepy it's horrible to see a person be killed and yeah not a good look for the guild okay so i had to put this scene in uh, for the later plot um but to wrap up this hiding part i liked the atmosphere i liked the conflict with insonia and this conflict only intensifies after, inevitably, she is captured by the guild. I feel like I'm retelling the plot in too much detail. I don't know. But basically what's, what follows is that Sonia meets Rothan, one of the characters that we've already met before, um, one of the people from the guild. He's kind of responsible for her. Like, she is a prisoner of the guild, but she's treated really nicely. Rothan is very nice to her. He's like, he kind of becomes like a father figure. He wants to help her. He wants the best for her. He's just the perfect person to try and gain her trust while she is being kept in those kind of luxurious rooms in the guild. And it's interesting to see how Sonea is starting to open up and step by step change her opinion of the guild and of magic while still sticking to her core values, I guess. It's like, yeah, the guild is helping enforce those really bad living conditions onto the poorer people of the city. And Sonea stays very, very critical of that. But she also starts to wonder if she could become a part of the guild despite that. And maybe even try to change the system from the inside out, kind of. And all the while she's starting to learn more about the guild. And also Rothen is starting to teach her basic control of her powers. Because if you remember, they were starting to become dangerous to her and to everyone around. And he tells her that she is basically going to have the choice between two options. Once she's mastered this basic control over her powers, she could either become part of the guild as a novice and learn how to use magic or the guild could bind her powers, which basically means take them away. And she could just go on with her life magic free. What a choice. Sonia at that point is pretty set on giving away her powers and being done with the guild. Okay, that in itself is already fairly interesting. But what would a fantasy story be without a villain? Remember the guy that Sonea accidentally injured when her magic first showed? Yeah, that one. Just a random member of the guild. She was throwing a brick at him in a proper street riot, actually. And because she was unknowingly using magic, she was able to hurt the guy. Yeah, she could not have chosen a better target, to be honest. 
because this guy, Fergun is his name, he is, for one, an asshole, and he's also super classist. He not only wants to make sure that Sonea does not become part of the guild, he wants to use her as an example to ensure that none of the poor people would ever be accepted in the guild. Gatekeep magic. How does he go about this? Easy. He kidnaps Sonea's best friend. I kind of feel like by now he deserves to have his name in this video. Problem is, I don't know how to pronounce it. Here's how it's written. So, Sari, Cherry, Siri, I don't know, let's call him Sari. So, he is visiting Sonea, and on his way out, he's unceremoniously locked into a basement room by Fergoon who then proceeds to use him to blackmail Sonea into complying with his plan. Which I guess is alright as a trope. I mean, trying to protect someone that you care about is a pretty good motivation to do pretty much anything. And I do get that Sonea still didn't really trust Rothen, her mentor, enough to be asking for help or tell him about it. Because yeah, he's nice to her, but she's also still a prisoner. But at the same time, I just feel myself a little bit bored of the whole I have to go behind everyone's back and figure this out on my own and no one can help me. I can't possibly tell anyone. Do you know what I mean? I mean, this does make sense in scenarios where you really don't know who you can trust, where everyone could be working with the enemy, that kind of thing. But I don't think she really mistrusts Rothen. It's more like she doesn't believe he could help, which I think is really such a teenage angst kind of thing to believe. Like, come on, you don't have to solve all the problems by yourself. You can actually ask for help. Yeah, getting a little bit of a Harry Potter vibe in this. And I'm getting a little bit off topic here, but this is just something that annoys me. Like, when the conflict could just so easily be resolved by talking to each other. I find this even worse in romance, like half of all rom-coms are based on this, when there is literally no problem, everything is just a misunderstanding that could be resolved by just talking and saving us all the trouble. But okay, that is not the point here. How does this situation get resolved? Basically, what Fergun, the bad guy, wants Sunea to do is tell everyone at this kind of hearing where she can choose whether she wants to keep her powers or not, that she does want to keep her powers, she does want to study magic, and she wants Fergun as her mentor. So he can fulfill his evil plan, whatever that is, we're never actually told. It's all about who detected her magic first. Was it Rothen or Fergun, who were both present when she first used magic? And she's to tell everyone that Fergun was looking at her while she was using magic. That's basically it. And Sonea is about to do that because Sari is being held hostage. But a character that I just realized I have not spoken about in this video at all until now. Mistake on my part, because he is great. So, new character, Daniel. Daniel is a friend of Rotten. He's a bit younger. 
he's cool and he realized over the last time that something must be up something's not right here and he by chance or maybe because he was mistrusting Fergun and was observing him a little bit more closely he saw Fergun go into the tunnels underground with a tray of food now he was wondering why would he do that that is weird behavior so now he kind of uses the moment where everyone's busy to go investigate those tunnels however you are not to use those tunnels that's just not a thing basically because the high lord of the guild kind of wants the tunnels for himself i don't know if this is the official reason but that's the reason so what happens is daniel stumbles into the high lord lord Akron, and gets told to leave before he can find sari it is in the end Akron, the high lord who finds sari frees him and takes him to the hearing where Sunea is about to tell everyone, or I think just told everyone, that she wants Fergun for her mentor. So it's a grand entry. She can finally tell everyone that she was being blackmailed and that Fergun kept Terry locked up. So all is well, right? Kind of. In order to prove that Sonia is actually telling the truth now, because she was just lying a few minutes ago, and this is a big accusation that she just made, the administrator of the guild is going to read her mind about this. Like, he's going to look at her memories, whether what she just told is actually true. While looking through Sunea's memories, he not only finds confirmation that what she tells is the truth, but he also kind of stumbles upon her memory of that scene where she witnessed a murder taking place on the grounds of the guild. Remember when I said it was important for the further plot? That assassin guy, as it turns out, is none other than the High Lord of the Guild, Lord Acheron. Wow, what news. And not only is he seen killing someone in this memory, he's doing so using black magic. Now, the whole trilogy is called Black Magician's Guild, so at some point, the black magic part was going to come into the story. This point is now. We don't really learn much about it at that point, only that it's evil, it's forbidden, it's black magic is no good. You're not going near that. You don't want to have anything to do with it. So obviously, it comes as a big shock for Lolan, the administrator, who's also a good personal fr friend of Lord Akron, to see him use black magic. Like, that's super evil. He chooses to ask Sunea to not ever tell anyone about what she witnessed, except for Rothan, who is going to be her mentor, who would find out eventually, because they are studying, going into each other's mind, etc. And he says he is going to handle this situation but it has to be handled with much care because who knows how powerful Akron might be if he's using black magic so that kind of sets up the plot of the next books um here all that's left to do for Sunea is to finally choose whether she wants to stay with the guild and she does choose so in part because she's super scared of Akron, um, and also because 
she does find good in magic now. She wants to become a healer. She wants to do good with her magic. She wants to open a hospital for the poor people. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much the end of the first book. Wow. Okay, going into this, I was not actually planning to retell the whole plot. That wasn't my goal, but here it is. And as I said, I did like this book. I thought it was certainly entertaining. I personally didn't feel that strong of a connection to the world or the characters. Like, both were fine. Sonea is a likable enough protagonist. Even though I think the book did not make me care that much for her. I liked Rothman and Daniel. Terry had some moments. He's gonna improve over the next books. And the world is, I would say, well thought out. It's, I guess for me personally, it's not magical enough for a story about magic. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't particularly want to live in that world. Um and I don't know how to explain that, but the story sometimes felt to me like it existed in kind of a vacuum um with those the city and the hierarchies within the guild and stuff like that. But there are some connections to other places other countries made in the second book so i like that it's going to feel more like a world um yeah i don't actually have that much to say i just realized i don't think i know too many similar books that came out during the last few years i mean like random young person discovers they have magical powers and struggle with the consequences is just a common enough trope, I guess. But executed like this, I can't really think of that many similar books right now. Let me know in the comments if any come to mind for you. Um... I guess I was thinking a lot about books two and three when I had the idea of making this video. Especially when we're getting into the whole like magic school thing. And of course the romance part. Yeah, I do have things to say about that. And also about the ending. But for this book, I think it was a good introduction into the series, but it was also kind of able to just stand for itself. I mean, after this book, you've just read an interesting adventure fantasy story with not too much action happening, actually, but yeah, it was fine. It was like an adventure story with there's choice to make and book two will be very different. It will go heavily into this magic school, magic education and everything surrounding school life um, while struggling with the dark, dark secret <laughs> she knows about the very well-respected High Lord of the Guild. And book three will be something else entirely. Again, more of an adventure story with a lot of stuff happening. Um, but yeah, book one is fine. Go ahead and read it if you like to. And okay, wow. I guess that's all I have to say for now for the first book. It was a solid start into the series. And I might do books two and three some time. I have no idea if anyone will even listen to me rambling on about an old book in my 
accent. But if you did, say hello in the comments so I know you've got until the end. And I don't know, I might just do books two and three regardless because this was actually a lot of fun. And maybe I'm just talking into the void of the internet, but I would be really interested in your thoughts. Do you remember the series? Have you maybe read it as a teenager, as I did? And yeah, I don't know if you can tell, probably, but this is actually my very first YouTube video ever. So this is kind of exciting. If you wanna one day, I don't know when, um, listen to me talk about books two and three, then you are very, very welcome to follow me. And I guess that's it. Thank you for being here. You're awesome. Bye bye.